Okay, so, uh, but I want to talk about machine learning a little bit, and basically I want to build a bridge between distributed computing and machine learning. So it's very close to Fabian's topic, I would say, but still very far away at the same time. So it's close to his first three minutes or something uh, that he, uh, in, in his first session. This is just a slide about me. Uh, I'm basically interested in new uh, networks, and this includes all sorts of new uh, networks, and actually change my topic every few years. And now I would say we do a lot of about deep neural networks in my group, but also we do a things about blockchain or uh, generally like agreement protocols in the group and other things as well, social networks and whatnot. What is in the background is a picture of the deep network. But that's about me, so let's talk about machine learning a little bit. So I think this is, you know, we live in a great time. There's a lot of progress in machine learning. And to show this, I have these two pictures here. Uh, I should say they look a bit similar maybe, as you can see. One of these pictures won the World Sony Photography Award, like it's one of the highest photography awards you can win. And it was done by a machine, okay? And the other one was done by myself, also with a machine, okay? <laughs> now you can figure out which one won the award and which one actually I did in five minutes. Uh, I don't know. Both of, the, both of us used Midjourney, one of these picture generating tools. Any guesses? Mine is the right one. The other one? Ah, interesting. Okay, so so really, so this is mine. <laughs> this is mine. This is the other one. And I saw this, and I felt like I can do this as well. And with a friend together, we tried this a little bit, and we wanted to have this 1920s or so style. So we said 1920s, and we wanted to have this desperate look. And so we said that this mother and daughter go to the dentist together so that they, uh, <laughs> they have this fear in their eyes. Okay. And you know, you find lots of things online and it's really a great time, like a poem about traffic lights. I could not have done it myself. Mm -hmm. In the heart of a bustling city's night, a sentinel stands glowing. It's really, really nice. You can look it up yourself. Or you know, this one here. Uh, this is like uh, Terminator 2 in the style of Wes Anderson. Uh, basically, somebody asks a chat uh, module, can you do this in the style of Wes Anderson? Then it come up, comes up with, uh, which actors should play there, what should they play, also animates it in some sense. So all this you can do basically in, a, in an afternoon yeah, without sound. Good, okay, but let's get serious. Uh, what do they, these two things have in common, okay? So I would say, generally speaking, people in the distributed systems or distributed computing community embrace learning quite a bit. So these are a few of the people, for instance, Rashid from EPFL, uh, you might know or Dan Alistar, some of you might know from IST. They do a lot of work in learning these days. And basically they take the biggest export, one of the biggest exports of distributed computing, this Byzantine, and they move it to machine learning. You can say you want to have something like distributed machine learning where several machines work together. And then one of them is Byzantine and the other ones have to figure out how to deal with that, okay? So that's, I would say, the standard way you see this. It's very systems-like uh, research. It's not so much algorithms-like research, but I also have done a few of those papers. And these are, Nisha Witt maybe actually is the most uh, famous one in the machine learning world coming from the distributed computing world, I would say. But he left a decade ago. All right, so what I want to talk about is the right-hand side. So these are basically distributed computing topics. On the left-hand side, you have the concurrency, consensus, agreement people, you know, which have uh, terms like Byzantine or federated is the term machine learning people use when they say several machines do something together. So when they say distributed, they really mean federated or vice versa. And on the other hand, you have the graph algorithms type people. And I actually put the picture of Fabian up. Because <laughs> uh, he's a quintessential graph algorithms type person, I guess. One of the 10 or so he showed. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the right-hand side a little bit. I'm not going to talk about the left, the system side. Okay. So why do I care? So when I look at machine learning, what it usually is good at, if you take, let's say, deep neural networks, it's very good at handling data which comes in this very boxy shape, okay? It can do well with uh, working with vectors. It can work well with matrices or with so-called tensors basically multidimensional matrices if you want. 
So these are the things machine learning can handle well. Like images, for instance, you have an image, then you have these pixels, and you have this very boxy, you know, very restricted input. However, as I told you before, I like networks. So the question is, how can we learn things about networks? So that's basically the, the idea here. And networks are important. So for instance, here's a traffic network. I stole this from DeepMind. So what you have is you have something like a road network, and then you are going to turn this road network into a graph like you would expect here. You take little pieces of uh, road, and this becomes a graph. And then in the graph, every node becomes sort of like a little neuron, a little neural network, even if you like. And it communicates with its neighbor neurons, and that way you try to predict things about traffic, for instance, okay? You try to predict, you know, how bad will be the traffic jam in some location at some time when you have the current situation, okay? One, one hour out, for instance, how bad will it be? That's very important for Google, of course, if they try to give you directions where to drive, right? And uh, so this will be a typical graph application for a neural network. And I have a few more all stolen from usually DeepMind. Uh, there's the folding network you might have heard where they fold these proteins together and they're very good at it. And that, of course, is also somewhat a graph slash geometry application. It's not just a boxy image application. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's not as much graph as I would like personally, but I still put it on here. Uh, I'm not going to explain it. Or there's also other things which are maybe not immediately seen as a graph, but they are somewhat graph-like as well. And here is one which is a physical simulation. So they have, this is actually a complicated physical simulation. It's still a simulation of water molecules, if you want, or water in general. And this is kind of the same thing with a graph neural network. And it can simulate all sorts of, you know, uh, things, all sorts of uh, elements, water or sand or whatnot. And this is how it does it. You see these little nodes, essentially. And now they're mobile nodes. They move in space. And they, you know, and then you can, with that, show how matter moves around. It's quite interesting. Uh, this, oh, there's sound here. I don't want sound. How do I get rid of sound? Like this, OK. OK. Oh, just comes back. Ah, that's weird. I can. Just stop it like that. Anyway, so this is at the MoMA uh, some sort of art exhibition. I think people like it very much who are in art. And you can, you saw it like on the picture. It looks a little bit like the simulation of, of matter. So generally, we want to understand learning, how learning works in connection with graphs. And I would say these are the two classical problems you are interested in, you want to solve. So one is graph classification. So I give you a bunch of graphs, a bunch of networks, and I want to know, is this graph of that type or of that other type? This is like distinguishing cats and dogs, but for graphs, OK? You have to say, is this a graph of some type? Is this not a graph of some type? And of course, this is not, you know, these are not simple graphs. It's not, is it a planar graph or is it not a planar graph? It's something where humans have trouble to distinguish what they are, right? And that's something. Uh, the neural network people le really care about classification. Uh, they don't care about MIS and uh, all these things, unfortunately. Or uh, this is also a very classic uh, thing to do is node classification. So you're given a graph, but the nodes are of certain types. So here uh, shown with colors, and some nodes don't know what they are. Okay, it could be let's say here it could be the Swiss people and the non-Swiss people. And the edges will be, you know, uh, whether they're friends or something like that. And then you try to figure out for some nodes you don't know what they could be, okay? What are the, maybe it's a bit of a boring example, but, uh, but generally try to classify the nodes. And these are just two, I would say, the most important two things you can do with neural networks in terms of graphs. Other things are link predictions. You don't know whether these two people know each other in the social network, and then you predict that. Uh, community detection, and other things. I'm going to talk about these other things a bit later on. So all these things we want to do with learning, and interestingly, it has a connection to distributed computing, and that's where I'm coming in a second. 
when I explain these so-called graph neural networks. So these are really neural networks like the ones you have maybe seen in pictures where you have some input and then it goes through these hidden layers with all these little neurons to some output at the end, for instance, for graph, graph classification. But the question is, how do you handle the input here? This is, let's say, a vector input. This is a typical uh, neural network, a very small one, though. And it can, it's do, doing well when the input is a vector where all these neurons here are basically one element of a vector. But with a graph, you cannot do that so well, okay? You cannot really input it like that. So we need a neural network which can work on graphs, and that's not it. Also graphs, you know, maybe you can learn and train the network on small graphs, but then you want to run them on much larger graphs. And that would not be possible with these classic neural networks because they always have a fixed input, right? It's always the same number of nodes as an input. And so it does not work to train on smaller graphs and then work later on larger graphs. So how do we do that? Yeah, and this is coming, you know, the, this, this is the computing versus machine learning uh, metaphor in some sense. And uh, yeah, even wrote a little paper about it. If you really wanna know more details, you can look at this. It summarizes kind of what I'm presenting today, but only today. Good, so how does it work? So again, let's look at distributed computing. And these are the two slides, or the one slide, which is very close to Fabian's slide. So in message passing algorithms, or he called it local algorithms or conscious algorithms, we have these nodes in a network and they communicate with their neighbors by sending messages, okay? So basically in each synchronous round, every node sends a message to its neighbors. I have this little post-it on the right. So basically nodes send in each round a message. Every node sends a message. Then they receive the messages from the neighbors and then they do a little computation and then they go to the next round. So that's how Fabian and many other people would define what is distributed computing or what is basically the local or the conscious model, depending whether the messages can be large or not. Now, for learning with graphs, for graph neural networks, the picture is exactly the same, okay? It works exactly the same way. Uh, every node in every round sends a message to its neighbors, gets the messages from its neighbors, and then computes something, okay? So that's why I think it's very cool for us to look into this, right? Because if it's the same thing, maybe we can apply our great methods to it and, uh, you know, be the cool guys in the machine learning crowd. I don't know if that's something you like. So there are differences, of course. So this is distributed computing versus machine learning. So one difference is uh, in our track, distributed computing, it's a designed algorithm, right? Some smart people sit down and they write down an algorithm, how it should work. In machine learning, the idea it would be that this is learned. What you do is learned in some sense, okay? Then another difference is that in distributed computing, we usually have the node IDs. Every node knows who they are. They have a value between one and n or log n bits or something like this. And in machine learning, usually there's no node IDs. The nodes are anonymous, okay? They have no ID. They might have features. They might have something like an initial color or something like that, but it's ID free. And like people here also study these anonymous networks. So there are some papers, I would say, maybe at, at least a dozen or something which do that, but not, maybe not thousands, okay? But some exist. Uh, there's another big difference. So in distributed computing, individual messages matter in some sense. So when you get a message from your neighbor, then you have this message, you can grab it and you can do something with it. You can identify the message, whereas machine learning, weirdly enough, and I'm gonna show that in a second, they have aggregated messages. So when you get the message from your neighbors, you don't get all the individual messages, but you just get an aggregation of those messages. Something like the sum of all the messages, which is very weird. If you know something about information theory, you would think, why would they do that, right? That makes no sense, but they do that, and it makes no sense. Uh, and then, of course, maybe the biggest difference is what they try to solve. So here you have graph problems like coloring or routing or MIS uh, and whatnot, right? And here basically you have these classification problems. So this, those are the classic problems here. Node classification, edge classification, graph classification, as I said before. Okay, so these are the main differences, I would say. Yes? So a few years ago, we saw in computing and other theory venues, these tracks 
actual work set from biologists, which is given an algorithm. That seems to have some pieces from the right and some pieces from the left. Yeah. They always try to solve consensus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody tries to solve consensus. Uh, no, true. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a very interesting application area, I would say, for, for Fabian's line of work, right? The biological algorithms. Actually, actually, many people from this graph algorithms jumped on this topic and said, ah, finally, they have a good application area, right? When I did uh, uh, graph algorithms back then in 2000, almost said 1900 something, but it's actually 2000 something, early 2000s, we thought wireless networks are going to be the future. And that's the application for graph algorithms. I, I went into this area because I felt this is for wireless networks. But then wireless networks never really, the, the kind of networks you envisioned never really came about. So now the biology guys came in, I think, and they took the application from that. And I think this is a new application for that uh, learning. Okay, So I think in that sense, it's a, maybe it's the real application this community has been waiting for. for a, Yeah, it's a mix of things, you know. <laughs> Mostly I put these slides up, DC and ML, for a joke at the very end, but uh, yeah. So when, when you say graph classification problem, what specifically you, you mean? Because basically every decision problem writes graphs because of its type, right? There's yes. Almost every NT something. Yes, yes. Every problem in NT about graphs is a, is a graph classification problem. No, there are many uh, which make sense, I would say. For instance, in medicine, they want to have something like the, the graph is, let's say, a chemical graph, how the chemist, like, the chemical looks like. And then you say, is this a good thing against cancer or something, right? So you classify cancer medicine against non-cancer medicine. Those are typical things people want to solve, I think. Like, people with money want to solve. I'm, uh, Oh, yeah, exactly. It's that we come to that. It's very bad at this stage, but that's what we want to solve, right? We want to be able to uh, to do this better. Now, uh, coloring, let's say, well, it lives on the left side for a reason, I think. I don't think we can change, you know. I don't think machine learning will be able to do that better than than you, in some sense, right? Ever, maybe even. But uh, this is really for more complicated problems where it's not so clear what you actually want, but you have a lot of examples, okay? I think that's the, the main difference here. Yeah? Good, everybody happy again. So I'm gonna give you a more detailed view. This was just the differences basically now, the detailed view. Uh, so this is a slide from my student, and I'm not sure whether it works so well, but I'm going to show it nevertheless, because then I have an even more detailed view, which is basically my view. Uh, so graph neural networks have tried to work with graphs. Okay, here's an example graph, and we are interested in this node in the middle, node V. And what we do really, and this is similar to this distributed computing paradigm, message passing paradigm, first we get the information from our direct neighbors, okay? Uh, and this is aggregated, okay? And when I say the information from the neighbor, so every neighbor basically lives in a state. It's H here in this. I do have formulas on the slides from my student. So all of these nodes are in some state initially. It could be the empty state. They might not know anything about it. And then you aggregate this information somehow. And when I say aggregate, I mean something like you take the average of these values, okay? Maybe all the neighbors have a value, you take the average of those values, or you take the sum of those values, or you take the max or the mean of those values. Those are the typical things you can do when you aggregate. And it could also be a vector, right, or a tensor even. So the node's description could be a vector uh, or a tensor. That's fine as well. So you aggregate first, and then you update your own state. You t and basically this is another function, the update function, and it takes your old state, so the state, your initial state at the beginning, and this aggregate from your neighbors, and then you update your state based on these two things, okay? And now the update thing step is a little neural network usually, okay? Tiny little neural network. Not with, not with super many layers and super many states, just something small. And every node does this. This is what I said before, they all do this in parallel. They start off with their initial state, the feature, something like the color or something, if they have something like that, and then they update, 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 uh, like that. A few rounds, not too many rounds, so T is kind of the number of rounds, similar to 
the time that we had before, and you do it for a few rounds. So here's my way to explain it, same thing. Uh, I'm still explaining the same thing. Graph neural networks, what they are. I have a little tiny graph here, just three nodes that I'm using as an example. And now every node has an initial state, and the state is a vector here in my example with two values, okay? So uh, this is always a value, and every node has two values at initially. And now we feed this into a little neural network, these two values. Uh, hopefully you can see that. So the top two values inputs of this little neural network, they are the original state of that node. But it has more inputs here. And you can see these other inputs, these are basically the values of your neighbors, okay? So U only has one neighbor V, so that value of V goes directly into this little neural network. And the same for uh, w, it just gets v's value. But now, what does v feed in? So this is the more interesting case. It basically has to feed in the information of all its neighbors. And it could be something like the sum or the average or the mean, what I said before, right? Uh, average and mean is the same thing. So but min, max also. Like, it is this aggregation function we put in there, okay? And that's the beauty of the aggregation. This means we can always use the same little neural network, uh, no matter how many neighbors you have, right? This node only has one neighbor, but it has the same input. This node has actually more than one neighbor, but thanks to this summing up, the same thing comes out here. So they have the same input. And now the values go through this little neural network, and that's one round of communication. And then something comes out, and that's basically the input to the next round. And then you do the same thing again. You have the little neural networks, and they go in there, we have to sum up if you have more than one neighbor, and so on. So it pipes through this whole network. And let's say I do this for three rounds. I have a three-round algorithm I want to learn. And at the end, this is the output, right? So these two uh, nodes here, same as what I had for an input, is the output for that node, okay? So that's how a graph neural network look like. That's why these little networks are basically little, because if you have a large graph and you have many rounds, right, you see this thing blows up very quickly, okay? So it becomes a large neural network no matter what you do. Okay, is this clear? So let me, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with learning how much, so let me quickly tell you something about learning. It's not really necessary to understand everything I tell you, but maybe it's still a good thing. So what you get here in output, when you, when you train such a neural network, right, then you have examples. For instance, this is for node classification. So as an output, you want this node to be of a certain type, okay? You can say it's, what I said before, Swiss people and non-Swiss people. Let's say Swiss people are a zero, and non-Swiss people are a one, or Swiss people are a one here, zero here, and non-Swiss people are a one here and a zero here, something like that. So that the output distinguishes what you want. Now the neural network, you would initialize it with completely random weights. So whatever these little neurons do, they basically take their input and then they multiply it with a little weight and they add even a little bias to it and then they feed this forward. So you get complete garbage, random garbage as an output. But then you say, what you really want here is let's say one zero. And you say, what did I get? How far is it from one zero? And this is the loss you have, the error you have. And then you can back propagate, which means you change the weights in this network by going back inside this network. So the weights adapt so that they would produce more what you want in the end. Okay, so that's the hope here. And if you train it with a bunch of examples, then this will get better and better. And at the end, you know, this will basically give you what you want. Okay, so that's the, the one minute version of uh, explaining neural networks. Uh, with, the, with the form of graph neural networks. So that's how we train it, and that's how we can use it later on. When we use it, we have to train weights. We just pipe it through, and we see what comes out. Good. Let's go to limitations quickly. So they are not very good, as we have just heard. They cannot do many things. And this is when it becomes somewhat interesting for distributed computing, I think, because we see typical distributed computing things <coughs> happening here. So here I have two networks, and for people interested in graphs or distributed computing, they look very different, okay? Uh, they look similar, but still they're not the same graph, okay? 
But for a neural network, they are the same graph really. They cannot distinguish those two graphs. And the reason is that, let's say, let's look at these nodes V here. If you look at such a node V, if you think back of our neural network, the big one, it is a gray node. That's good, okay. It has two white neighbors. All it gets initially gets, these nodes only know their color initially. They will tell them we are white neighbors and then it also has one gray neighbor. But this gray node here is exactly the same situation. It also has one gray neighbor and two white neighbor, uh, neighbors. In some sense, they, they have the same world view, okay. They get the very same data from their neighbors in the first layer, in the first round of this graph neural network. And same for the white nodes. If you look at the white nodes, they have one white neighbor and one gray neighbor. And you see, for instance, the network is very bad at understanding, let's say here, this node might think it has a white neighbor, which itself has a white neighbor, which itself has a gray neighbor. It cannot understand that this gray neighbor is actually the node itself. Whereas here it's also a white neighbor, which has a white neighbor, which is a gray neighbor, but in this case it's a different gray neighbor, okay? So it's, uh, <clears throat> this is the problem of GNNs. Since they just aggregate the information of the neighbors all, uh, over multiple rounds, they can never distinguish these two graphs. Yes? Yes, that's possible. You can ha add an IDs. They don't like to do that, okay? And I can tell you why. Let's say if the nodes get IDs, for instance, then it could be that it learns that this network here is the network which has, let's say, ID 17 inside. And this network, let's say, does not have ID 17 inside during training. And then in the end, it would say, ah, I learned if ID number 17 is inside the network, then it's this one. And if not, it's that one, right? And there's nothing to do with the actual truth, what you want to learn here. It kind of, the more information you give it, the better it can somewhat distinguish things, right? Then it can understand that maybe this node here will be the same again after one round and they're not. But you also added a lot of information to it, which also distracts it a lot. And then it will learn something else probably, okay? But that's exactly what we want to do, right? We want to understand this better. Yeah, so, yeah, those two are the same. But these two, for instance, are not at all the same, right? They, they might look the same, but they, you can see here, one gray node has two gray neighbors. That's immediately <coughs> clear for the neural network that this would be different. And there's something known as the weisfeiler lehmann test, and this comes from, this is a very early attempt of doing graph isomorphism. And Basically what you can say is if you look at these base graph neural networks, which don't, there's many versions of them, but which don't do anything smart, then they are less powerful than this test. What is this test? So it's an easy way to color, to relabel or color graphs. And I stole this from the internet somewhere. So the idea is that you have original labels here in the graph. For instance, all the leaves in this little graph here have label A, and all the non-leaves have label B. I don't know why, but that's something they can immediately distinguish. And then you check, uh, you do a round of communication, and you can relabel the nodes. You can say, now I can see, I can distinguish this node from this node. Why? Because B had two A neighbors, and this B here had only one A neighbor, so I know that they are different. So basically you take the node itself and you take its neighborhood, you can even aggregate it. And if the hash of these two things basically wouldn't hash to the same value, then you can say, now I can distinguish these two nodes and you give them different names here. And then if you do it another round, then you can also distinguish these nodes from each other. And the reason is now that this node here is neighbors to a node called D in this example. And this node is a node, uh, neighbor to a node called E. And so we can also distinguish these two nodes from each other. However, these two nodes, we can do as long as we want, right? We can never distinguish them. They are the same because they are just neighbors of this one node here, of the same nodes, so they're indistinguishable in some sense. And that's the weisfeiler lehmann graph algorithm, if we want, or graph coloring algorithm, where you just have a few rounds of this until basically things stay stable. And that's what graph neural networks can distinguish and not more than that. It's exactly that. Okay.
Good. Uh, where did I want to go with this? Yeah, I don't like the B here. Maybe it should rather be B prime there because you can also distinguish that from the very beginning. And there's something called a wise file, a Lehmann test of a higher dimension. Uh, so this is a bit weird. So this is, there's a hierarchy of wise file, the Lehmann tests. Basically what they do is in the simplest one, they take each node by itself. But in more complicated ones, they take groups of nodes as basically nodes of a metagraph, and then they do the same thing there. And if you go all the way to the Weiss file, the Lehmann test of n, the number of nodes, then actually you can solve graph isomorphism, the graph isomorphism problem, but it's an exponential algorithm, so it's not very good anymore. But this is just an example of two graphs which are even the same, even colored graphs, so the edges here have colors like in the picture, and even for a higher level of Weiss file and Lehmann tests, they are indistinguishable from each other. Okay. So the rook's graph is basically what the rook uh, moves in chess, like the moves of the rook. It can go horizontal and vertical. And, uh, and the Schrikonde graph, I don't know. Somebody made this up. Good. And it fails even on cycles, right? Uh, what we heard before. So because cycles or also other types of graphs, they're very regular in some sense, and, and then all you can do here is you can say, well, I'm a node, I have two neighbors, and they also have two neighbors themselves, and so on, but basically for a graph neural network, these two look the same. Good. And this is known in machine learning as oversmoothing somehow, okay? They call this oversmoothing. They say oversmoothing is when you have these neighbor informations, but you you can't really use them because you just aggregate them and they get all smushy and the same. And in distributed computing, you'll probably say this is a problem because the network is really anonymous, right? You cannot really say who is who. And that's, this is me again after three rounds or so. That's what they call oversmoothing. And they have other funny terms. They call something underreaching. And underreaching is what we would call local, okay? They would say, ah, I have to learn something about the graph but somehow the information I need at this node is five hops away from me. It's at the node which is five hops away from me. So if I have just a, a graph neural network which just is four layers long, then it will only learn information four hops away from me and not five hops away from me, so then I cannot learn that, right? That sounds like a deep insight for you know, us because we have understood this, I think, from day one when we, when we learned about distributed algorithms. Or they have something called over-squashing, and that's a fancy term for, I would say, congest. Uh, so this is kind of, again, when you have a lot of data which has to go through some congestion, like some, there's some, only a few edges which connect some part of the network with some other part of the network, and because of all this aggregation and whatnot, you know, there's only a few bits which travel through that, then you cannot really learn what's going on on this side, and that's kind of what we call the congest problem. So it's basically the same problems. They study the same problems, and this, this is just, you know, figured out two or three years ago. It's not, uh, you know, that they have a 20-year-old history of this. Uh, and we do have a 20-year-old history of this. Uh, and that, you know, already shows that they didn't use our words, that they didn't really know what we're doing. So now, like your comment from the back, right, can we have more expressive GNNs? Something that can solve that, and you know, many people tried this, including ourselves here. This is one example from a paper from ours. What we do here, we, we do what we call dropouts in this paper. It's a bit different from what machine learning people call dropouts, so there we do the same thing that they, they did to us. We just uh, change the words. So what we do is basically we run a GNN several times, but each time we drop some nodes with some probability, independently, actually. So let's say in the first run we drop that node here, and, and then we just check what comes out of it, and then in the second run we drop, let's say, these two nodes. Just we chose each one independently with some probability. And in the third run maybe we drop no nodes, okay, that's possible. And then the idea is that if we drop nodes like this randomly, then we would give, get different frequency profiles of what happens uh, depending on the graph, right? For instance, we can easily distinguish these two cycles from each other because a dropout on the right-hand side gives us something, right? So now we have this weird-looking graph there, and we can never get that graph on the left side, no matter what dropout we have. Either what we get is, when we have no dropout, then basically 
you know, it goes to infinity because you can just run around this uh, graph all the time. So what we see is basically infinity long chain at each node. Or, you know, we get a much smaller chain, but we never get this, you know, one, two, three, four, five node chain that we get on the right hand side. And on the other hand, if this drops out, that's a somewhat unlikely on the right hand side. So you get quite different profiles and you can recognize these these variants of what happens, right? And you can say, because of this, I know that I got now this result and I did training and I've seen this result before in training and I know now that I'm on the right hand side. I have this graph and I do graph classification. Same for my example before. So here I can have dropouts and it gives me very different graphs on the left and on the right, right? So this dropout here gives you something gives you a little triangle, which would mean since you would talk to the neighbors of neighbors and so on, you basically have a linked list again, where every third node is a gray node. You cannot have this on the right hand side. No matter what you drop out, you don't get this nice little, uh, you know, uh, infinite linked list. So these are easy to learn and we can, uh, with that, do that very well. And this is, I would say, a much, you know, in some sense, the, the the, the knife we use to change something in the graph is much smaller than the, the incision is much smaller, I guess the medical person would say, than if we give random node names to everybody, right? Then it's like a huge number of information. This is little information and maybe we can still solve many things that way. Uh, yeah, so we studied this a little bit, you know, and I'm not gonna tell more about this. But you can really see that it helps a lot. So for instance, also for aggregation of neighbors, mean aggregation of neighbors, here we have two situations. If we just take the average of the information of the neighbors, then these two things would look very similar, right? They would both have an average of 0 0.5 uh, among the values of the neighbors. Whereas if you have dropouts, we can on the right get something like a 0 0.66 value, which we can never reach on the left with the same input, no matter what drops out. So, uh, so that's that. So we studied this a little bit and there's a bit of math in it, but not much, I would say. This is, this made a paper at the best conference in machine learning and it even was a presentation paper. So it's like one of the best things you can have in machine learning. It's like a best paper award in our conferences because they accept like 10,000 papers or something. So if one of those 10,000 can present, it's already really great. And it's really trivial, okay? It's like the, the paper is a bit of Chernoff bounds and nothing more than that, right? It's not uh, very easy. If you want to have an easy life, go here. Yeah. And we showed also a little bit that you cannot do anything. You know, for instance, these two graphs, again, different graphs. If you have one dropouts only, then they would have the same uh, you know, distribution of results. That you basically have the same graphs. And now this is Basically, I, I re we reduced this to an almost pure graph theory problem, right? So you have dropouts on two different graphs and you ask yourself if you have certain types of dropouts, you only drop out one node, for instance, do I have the same profile of graph? Do I have get the same graphs on the left and on the right, right? This has nothing to do with machine learning anymore. This is a pure theoretical question and you can solve that and get a paper, I guess, if you find something new, right? Yeah, so, and even if we had port numbers, that's another possibility you can do. You cannot, uh, then you can distinguish any graphs, any two graphs is dropout. So it's just, this is just graph theory, I would say at this point. I'm not gonna show any of the proofs because today is gonna be an introduction and tomorrow in the last lecture is gonna be an outlook, so it's also no formulas. So people studied this, so they, they came up in the last two, three years, they came up with all sorts of ideas how to enrich uh, neural, a graph such that neural networks can distinguish graphs. For instance, one suggestion is port numbers. And here are two graphs, the left-hand graph and the right-hand graph. Even if you add port numbers, these two graphs are essentially the same. So here you see an orange node and it has a blue neighbor on port one and on port two it has this, whatever this is, green or something neighbor. And the green neighbor, for instance, has a red neighbor on port one, but you can see here, if you do the same thing, you can, it has exactly the same information. So the nodes cannot distinguish, even with port numbers, which is a very heavy hammer, cannot distinguish the left and the right. 
or they looked at angle features. That's something we don't usually have in graphs, angles, but since chemistry or molecules is a big application, of course, they like to have angle information because they think they have it. Uh, but even with angle information, you see here two graphs, the left uh, non-connected graph and the right graph, and they all have 90 degrees ang angles everywhere. They cannot distinguish this. It doesn't help. Or, and this was mentioned before, we can have random features, we can have node IDs, or we can have random colors at the nodes, and we cannot distinguish uh, these two from each other. Well, here we can in this example, but, uh, but with a lot of you know, uh, extra hammer uh, information. So that's something else we did at some point, again with uh, Andras together, one of my our former PhD students in the group. So he did a, you know, basically graph theory, I would say, slash distributed algorithms PhD, but then at the end I told him let's do a bit of uh, machine learning because I'm thinking you're good at that, and he was good at that. Everything I gave him he immediately solved. So here uh, we looked at extensions. We, there's different types of extensions. For instance, dropping nodes. This would be part of this uh, line here. You can drop nodes. So this is called marking nodes. Actually, that's why it's called M here. So you can mark one node or two nodes or K nodes. And then you can do subgraphs or other things. You can have extensions and then we checked, is there one way of doing things which is strictly better than the other? And this graph just shows it's kind of complicated. So, uh, you know, uh, this here is strictly better than this, but not vice versa. There are examples where you can find that one is strictly better than the other and you can compare these different uh, measures. Good. Yeah, so this is a little bit of an overview. I'm shooting for seven now, right, as a determination point, right? So this is a bit of an overview, right? So we have this base GNN, okay, there's an old picture of it, but which has no information, no additional information. And then you can add information to it, let's say dropouts here, what I explained a bit uh, in more detail, or port numbers or random, random IDs even or other features. And the more you add, the better, of course, you get in terms of what this thing in principle can distinguish, okay? If you say you want node classification or graph classification, then the more information you add to it, the better it gets, the more expressive it gets, the, the, the graph neural network. But then this, there's a trade-off, right? So if you add less of that, initial, you know, this is just noise in some sense also from another point of view. If you add more and more information, then you add more and more noise to the input and then the graph neural network will basically take this noise and will try to learn patterns from this noise. So if you go to the left side, then you have basically easier learning and there's a trade-off between the two. And now, of course, in theory papers, you try to be as expressive as possible but it would also be good to you know, be as learnable as possible. That's what it is after all. Yeah, maybe this is a bit similar to advice complexity. I'm not sure. So probably there could be something like research which does this advice complexity. How much information do you really have to add in order to do this or that? That's maybe what I would try here if I did research in this area. Totally open. And yeah, compute. So you want to be able to compute something to just, you know, is it even possible to have a neural network which, which can produce this result? And then you have to learn it on top of that. That makes it much, much harder already to learn what you want to compute. And then you want to efficiently learn what you want to compute, right? So that's the, the top of the pyramid. So now, like when you look at expressivity, then they just are in this level, they say, what can we actually compute? What is possible? Which graphs can we distinguish with what kind of initial information? But then to learn that and to efficiently learn that is a is an other level, I would say. And we are not there at all. So that's all open. Good. Uh, so I have like ten minutes left, and let me give you. No, no, you know I like to do short talks. It's much better than long talks. And it's almost Friday, right? So it's time to uh, get relaxed a little bit. So one thing I don't like at all in this whole graph neural network area is this aggregation. Okay, I said it before, I think it's stupid uh, and I want something better, but I don't know what is better at this point. But we tried a few things. So this is one thing we tried and this is explained with a little comic. 
Uh, the idea is basically to take asynchronous distributed algorithms instead of synchronous distributed algorithms. So you know the difference. In asynchronous distributed algorithms, or maybe I could call it also sequential algorithms, you would treat each message individually almost naturally, right? You get a message, and now you have to do something with this message. You don't want to aggregate all your neighbors, like in the synchronous case. And I don't know how to get away without aggregation in the synchronous case because nodes have to do something no matter whether they have one neighbor or they have 10 neighbors, and aggregation seems to be the easiest thing. You don't want to learn a different neural network for, the, for different number of neighbors, right, for each node. That sounds overkill. You want to learn the same neural network. But this is learning asynchronous neural networks, and how it works is like this. So these nodes, when you run them, this is again for graph classification. Here you want to understand what are alcohols in a graph. So this H uh, uh, atom, it would learn to send a message to its neighbors, a base message. Here I wrote I, M, and H, okay? But of course they wouldn't send that. They would send a number or something, okay? But they learn, when they see R, I'm an H, I learn that I, without being, uh, you know, called by somebody, I tell my neighbor that I'm an H. And C would learn that it ignores these messages of H's, okay? It's not interested in this. It learns that. But O would learn that it really is interested in messages from H's for some reason. And so if O gets a message from an H neighbor, then O would also send out a message to its neighbor saying something like, oh, I have an H neighbor. It would also send something else, but uh, just a number or something. But, but basically, that's the information it would send out. And now C is very interested in this. C would say, ah, that's exactly what I was looking for, because I'm a C myself. And if I get such a message from an O, then I know that this is an alcohol. Then I would tell that this is an alcohol. Okay. I think this is the rule for alcohol, even though uh, it's an OH attached to a C or something. That's an alcohol, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very different way of doing things, and it works reasonably well, I would say, but it's not yet, you know, the, the best thing we can do. Something else we tried. So this is with agents. So really, I take the whole playbook of distributed algorithms and just try to, to say whether it works in... Uh, in uh, machine learning. So this is with basically agents walking around. So the agents originally are just very dumb. They just walk around randomly in this graph. But over time, they would try to understand how to walk around. They would move away from this just random walk to a more biased walk, whatever that means. They can also, they're quite powerful, they can also leave information behind. They can leave trace information behind. So that if they go somewhere and they see the, again that where they are, they can say, oh, I really learned that, you know, I've been here three steps ago or something. And then with that, maybe they can be trained to understand how to recognize structures in networks, okay? And it's even more complicated than this. This paper, it basically does it with several agents. But basically, it's agents walking around, leaving traces, trying to learn what's going on. And we try this, it works reasonably well, I would say again, but is it good? I don't know. You know, we tried this, here's a few examples. Uh, this is just, you know, these are made up examples just to show whether we can do things or not. So this is to learn how to recognize four cycles in the graph, okay? And some other things like this two uh, WL, Weiss, like a higher weiss felder lehmann thing I mentioned before. And you can see some classic new, uh, graph neural networks like JIN, for instance, cannot really do this very well. For instance, in four cycles, it has a correct guess at the end of 50%, which just means it ra randomly says yes or no, but it doesn't understand what, at all what's going on. Whereas, you know, even drop, uh, if we take a drop out version of JIN, then it can actually do that. And here the random box are, of course, like this is from our paper, so obviously we always have the bold numbers on our side. <laughs> yeah, so other people might uh, have other tests and then it doesn't work so well. Good, okay, uh, what else do I want to say? Not much, I think. Maybe one more thing, uh, just this thing. And then the rest I leave for tomorrow. GNN benchmarks, so 
people test this. So these are synthetic benchmarks. This is something we programmed ourselves to figure out what's going on. People use also real world benchmarks. For instance, this is one benchmark which is very popular among uh, graph neural network people. It's called the Cora benchmark. And the Cora benchmark is for papers. It's, uh, the graph is every node in the graph is a paper and every edge in the graph is a citation, okay? And then they try to figure out, they do node classification, they try to figure out from which area is this paper. Is it from computer science or is it from physics or whatnot, right? There's, I think there's seven areas that they have in this uh, graph. And they try to figure out for some nodes what they are, okay? And you can see here, this is out showing the edges, but it's well clustered somehow. But I would argue that the Cora benchmark is not very smart, right? It doesn't need any of these things here. It doesn't need to understand whether such a graph is there or such a graph is there because basically what they have is a lot of information at each node. For instance, they have the title of the paper at each node. They have the keywords of the paper. They have the neighbor labels. They know which, which uh, label, which area is all the cited papers in that, uh, in that paper. And of course, with that alone, you can figure out pretty much what's going on, right? It's not that you need to be super smart about the network topology. You can just say, well, if you know, uh, if all my neighbors are from cryptography, I'm probably from cryptography, okay? It's not, you know, uh, it's no rocket science. And I think this is a big problem for graph neural networks because if we test the graph neural networks on such simple, stupid data, then the simplest algorithm basically win, but we will never get any better for the harder problems, right? So that's, uh, yeah, that's the problem. So we want to have good benchmarks, and I think it's a harder problem than you might think. Like practical benchmarks are e hard to find, and also synthetic, like human-made benchmarks for GNNs is actually a tricky problem, and I don't quite know how to do it. Yeah, uh, and with that, I'm not gonna explain this, I think. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, it's basically, since you have bad data, it doesn't work well. So let me go to the very end. I have one more thing, but I'm gonna move it to tomorrow. So bigger picture, I think if you have distributed algorithms, which is something I looked at uh, in my life, all my life, it is related to these graph neural networks, very much so. And it's related also to graph isomorphism, I think, which is a nice, interesting problem and I didn't do that. Benchmarks is an open problem, and there's many more things here, and actually the talk tomorrow is gonna be about, mostly about this stuff down here. So I think there's a connection to something like, uh, you can learn algorithms from graph neural networks, and that's one uh, direction I'm really excited about, and I'm gonna talk about mostly about this tomorrow. Uh, good. Ah, the joke. Uh, yeah, distributed computing machine learning, uh, DC versus ML, reminds him a bit of DC versus Marvel. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Great, thanks. Good. Yeah, we're done. Uh, so for tomorrow, just to mention this again, so tomorrow the earlier session, you're gonna program a little bit. So there's this QR code. If you want, you can start already tonight. Uh, <laughs> no, but if you wanna come in tomorrow, uh, in the first session we do nothing else than this. You're basically sitting here, Diana's gonna help you because I'm too stupid apparently to do that. And uh, if you have problems, you can sit together of course and try to do this in parallel. You can program your own graph neural network. I think we're like the, there's one data set about chess or something, how to figure out something with chess, and the other data set about solving a maze with a graph neural network. So you don't tell how to solve a maze, it learns it itself how to solve a maze. So that's for tomorrow for the first session. And it's, you know, it's a collab where you basically go step by step through it and try to figure out what's happening. And then the second session tomorrow is a bit of an outlook about these algorithm learning. Okay, good, now I really stop. Thanks. Yes. So for this task, so you say graph classification. Yeah. Is this the best way to do it, or are other neural networks approaches more successful? 
Yes, there are others which I didn't mention so far. For instance, there's something called graph transformer. Yes. So the graph transformer does not do it the way anymore how we would do it, but basically it has an all-to-all -all connection. So every node talks directly to every other node. And that could help somehow. It feels wrong, right? It feels if the problem is really about graphs, you really want to talk to your neighbors, for instance, first, and not do the whole thing directly. Yeah, I also don't know. So that's, I would, yeah. So graph transformers have a, you know, a following. People like to do that. And as I said, like, this is the same for our asynchronous and agent thing, right? People try different things right now. And we're still not there that we have found the best way. And I presented here graph neural networks because I came after you, actually specifically asked to be after you. That was my only request for this, uh, <laughs> for this winter school because I felt then you, people see already a bit the theory of it and then they can connect a bit. Uh, and that's why I explained it that way. And I had the slides already. <laughs> that's the real reason. Okay, good. Uh, let's go for it. Good, so, uh, yeah, last uh, technical session, I guess. Welcome back to the machine learning party. Uh, so this today is going to be uh, a bit more on the philosophical side, I would say. It's not something I have done a lot of work in. I'm, it's something I'm very interested in, okay? And somehow I have this feeling that distributed algorithms are actually a very good metaphor or framework to understand what I call thinking slow. Uh, well, it's not me who called it like that. It's this uh, book by Daniel Kahneman. Maybe some of you have heard of it for sure, or maybe read it even. Uh, so basically, in this book, uh, this author explains that there's two ways of thinking. So if there's a thinking fast and think thinking slow uh, version of thinking. Thinking fast on the left side is basically effortless and speed, reflex, intuition, where you don't have to think a lot, okay? It's the opposite of what scientists should do, I guess. And on the right-hand side, you have the analytics and concentration and patience, and you have several steps to do something. So that's called thinking slow. He calls it system one and system two, but I think slow, slow and fast is actually better. So now machine learning is super good in the, on the left side. I would say it can do most of the things on the left side, okay? Uh, intuition, you know, figuring out what's the cat, what's the dog very quickly. I think it can do almost all those things well already, but on the right-hand side, many things are missing. And so I would like to understand this better. And actually the GNNs I mentioned yesterday are in some sense a gateway to go there, in my opinion. But this is more like research which I would like to do. I haven't really done much. I have done a few things and I explained them in this talk, but this is more open and, you know, <coughs> like professors will tell you this is kind of like a dog stool talk where you, do, you, this is what you plan to do, not what you have already done. Good, uh, let's quickly talk about thinking fast first. I have a few slides on for the left side as well. So the first slide, which I promised uh, uh, yesterday, is classification, okay? Uh, this is the famous picture, chihuahuas versus muffins. And I guess you can do it, but it's actually very difficult for machine learning uh, to do that. So that's a cl one classic thing we can do in machine learning classification, as we learned yesterday, no classification, graph classification, and so on. And the other one is regression. I also have a picture for that. Uh, it's a joke. Uh, maybe I can read the joke. <laughs> That's a number, you know, over time, how many husbands the, did this person have? And uh, before it was zero, now it's one, you know. And when you do regression, it probably goes to infinity very quickly. Good, so these are the two classic things in machine learning, classification and regression. But of course, machine learning is about many things, many other things as well, and here's a bunch of them. Uh, bunch of other things you can do. In particular, I think translation has been a major uh, thing going on. Computer vision, of course. So I would say many things, when, when you look at machine learning and you want to do something new, then you can check what the computer vision people did so far already. They are like at the forefront of development so far. 
Maybe until large language models. Uh, now it's not so clear anymore. But, but for a long time, they always did the things first. Whatever we tried on other modalities, they did already. This is also why in science, which, uh, computer vision has most of, some of the most cited conferences in all of science. I think the top three is something like science and nature, and then top four, and then there's also two machine learning computer vision conferences like CIS. CVCVC or something, ECCV, I don't know. Good, and generative art, of course, great topic. Again, uh, so we have this typical architecture. This is maybe the same slide from yesterday, roughly, with an input layer and the many hidden layers. And if you go for large models, then you have tons of parameters, okay? So this number I got from the internet, that's how, not how many neurons you have, but how many weights you have essentially, and every neuron has as many weights as it has these input edges, plus one. Uh, but this is a huge number, don't even dare to read it, uh, how they train these networks. And when it comes to thinking fast, these are the, the rulers now, which can do that very well. And this is a typical large language model and so this is GPT-4, this is the number of uh, parameters it has, and you can see that it grows essentially really exponentially. And when you wanna do research on these things, this is like highly secretive, we don't know what they really do, uh, but you have to go back quite a bit. I think like, you know, these models here are somewhat what is available. When we do testing or when we try something new, then we have to work with these models. So I'll explain you something that we did for BERT, one of those smaller models which is available. So the idea, uh, so BERT this is one of, these, uh, one of these language models where you basically uh, have uh, input tokens and then with those you produce output tokens. Like you can do it with translation, you go through the tokens basically word by word for the input and then you produce the next word or next token. Token is not exactly like a word but almost. And BERT is one of those models, and then maybe I've seen this picture here. So it has many components, so it's not so easily explainable. It's not one big block of neural network, but it has some sort of uh, encoding first, and then, uh, then uses this for, for outputs uh, later on. And it has many you know, attention heads and whatnot, uh, what is going on. So we were interested in this, just as an example of something which is not really distributed computing, but but has to do with learning and we did this work, so why not show it, is we looked at these feed-forward networks here because they are really the biggest part of BERT, okay? So they look like the network I just showed before, basically. They're this big block of uh, neurons. They make up 70% of all the parameters here. And in bigger language models, there's a, probably even much bigger, okay, the feed-forward parts, but we don't quite know because we don't have access to them, but. Uh, the suspicion is there 95% or so of all the networks. Now, of all the parameters. Now this thing almost stopped working again. So what they are, feed-forward networks, basically they, they have this, uh, you have these big layers and then they're well connected. Every node here connects to all the previous nodes and connects to the next layer of nodes. And instead, what we want to do is we want to build smaller networks. We want to only use a few of those parameters. We only want to only do the, a few of those nodes. So the idea is that we build something like a binary tree, essentially. And then the network would decide which of the neurons actually we want to, we want to talk to, okay? So instead of having these 1.7 trillion or so weights, we have sort of like experts in a binary tree where it's so depending on the current input, depending what we have to solve right now, what the topic is of the conversation, for instance, for a language model, we either go left or right in a binary tree and only use parts of this feed forward network. And how this works is really that we train this network and while we train it, usually in every node, then basically you have uh, these weights and we try to make the weights in such a way that depending on the input, basically one of the two neurons has very little weights. So when you look at the output, it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, you know, 
those weights don't matter much anymore. And so when we train, we have initially have a soft boundary between the two sides. Maybe first we, we almost have a balanced you know, information because it's all random, it's all balanced. But the more we train, the more we see that maybe one side becomes more of an expert than the other side. And so we go from this very soft boundary to somewhat a harder boundary to something like a very hard, you know, zero one boundary where we say at that point, you only care for one of the two sides. That's something we tried, but that works surprisingly well. Uh, so what we can do is, yeah, let me try to explain it here. So these are typical language models, BERT versions. So there's lots of, this is called BERTology. Uh, where you take BERT type systems and you analyze them. And there's different BERT models. And ours is also a different BERT model here. It's called ultra fast BERT in this version of the paper. And then we only use not 100% of these neurons or of the weights, but only like 0.3%. And then we test it on different language tasks. And you can see here how, how well it does. And it's roughly the same as if you use all neurons. So in some sense, uh, yeah, that's a neat, neat thing that we basically get the same, same quality. I should say BERT is not as good as you know, the newest language models, so it's easier to get some quality here with, as I said, much less neurons. Yeah, so this had some uh, media response. And the one I liked mostly was something like, where was it? Uh, Oh, maybe here, okay. According to scientists, we only use 0.3% of our neural networks. Imagine if we could use 100%. Okay, I guess uh, you know the quote. Good, let's go to the thinking uh, slow side. I think that's the one I want to talk about. So as I said before, there's different things we could do here. Different things which are really thinking fast and different things which are more thinking slow. And sometimes it's not so clear, for instance, if you think about generative art, I think we are very good at this already. I think we have seen some amazing uh, networks in this context, like for music, for instance, already it's doing very well. And for images, even more so. Now movies are a thing which come more and more. Uh, so generative art could maybe be an example of thinking fast rather than thinking slow because we are doing it so well. But it's not so clear what is what, right? So, for instance, if we go to uh, some GPT versions, can it do thinking slow, okay? So this is an interaction, I think this is GPT 3.5, so chat GPT, it's not with the GPT 4 version. I didn't quite dare to do it there, but. Uh, so you can ask it, for instance, what is five times seven? And then it would answer correctly, 35. Now, if you ask it what is something large number here times some other large number, then it also responds very quickly with something like this. And this looks decent, okay? Like if you do that, but then if you have a pocket calculator on the side and you do the same calculation, then you get a different number. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you see, it's almost the same thing. The, the beginning is right, the end is right, but the middle is completely <laughs> right, okay? So it has, a, it has an understanding what's going on. It understands multiplication, like, you know, in some reason, but it clearly doesn't do the algorithm, right? It just, it understands, okay, here I have a zero, so probably the last digit should be a zero. It understands that two times four is eight. It understands that. It understands the beginning. It understands the number of digits. Just not the middle part. Sorry? Yeah, it's ge it, it does something. And I think it's, it's definitely smart, right? It's like, I, I would be proud if some child could do that, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not correct, right? So, and this is something we we'll actually learn in primary school. But it's a typical example of thinking slow, in my opinion. You have to... You have to run the algorithm in your head, right? You have to do this kind of thing, right? And it doesn't do it because I think it can ultimately not do these things, okay? It's not made for these things. 
Now, some people claim you just need more neurons and then it can do this thing, okay? And some people claim, I'm not so sure, whether we need new architectures, so it's not clear what is the answer here. So what we were thinking about is, can we build benchmarks for thinking slow? Like benchmarks are, as I already said this yesterday, are the key to understanding in learning. We have to understand, you know, how can we measure that the thing can now do what it can do or not? So can we do a benchmark on thinking slow? And we tried this a little bit. So one idea we had was going through uh, sequences. So this is something you know also from, uh, from school, I guess. But it's considered to be a hard problem, right? So you have sequences, something like one, one, two, three, five, eight, what's the next number, okay? That's a, a sequence question. You, you have this in intelligence tests and like maybe in school tests or something. And then here it should say the output is 13 because it's sort of a big Fibonacci number, right? Fibonacci series. And then you can also ask different questions, what should be the numbers which are missing in, the, in this uh, sequence or are these two sequences similar or not? And what type of sequences is it? Classifier, is it a periodic sequence or not? So things like that. And, and ChatGPT, for instance, or GPT is very bad at these things. It cannot do this at all. And of course, you can argue that sequence continuation is actually a super difficult topic, right? Because if somebody here, if your student would write not 13, but a different number, then for sure you can find a reason why this is the also true, okay? because you can just fit the polynomial, for instance, through these numbers. But what we want is, in some sense, the simplest explanation. And, uh, and 13 here is maybe the simplest explanation. So we did that a little bit just to show that this doesn't work well. And uh, this comes from, the, the base data comes from this uh, online encyclopedia of integer sequences. I don't know if you have seen these. This is like a web page which gives you like hundreds of thousands of sequences. So if you ever have to figure out a, a rule in some, uh, you know, mathematical rule, if you see some pattern in some data and you have to figure out what's going on, you can feed the first few numbers into that website and then it maybe gives you the, the rule. Good, okay, and we also tried other benchmarks, so this is the newest one we try. Uh, so this is with basically puzzles. So I said this is from the Opodis talk, uh, and I was, this was in Japan, so I used something from Japan. Uh, but there are some puzzle collections which are really good, uh, which like something like Sudoku essentially. And we try to run machine learning on these puzzle collections. So my favorite one is this one. So if you want to ruin your life, uh, that's, those are good links. Uh, Simon Tatham's puzzles. So Simon Tatham is a programmer from the UK and, and he had, in the 80s or something programmed a bunch of puzzles in a system, and this is available, so we could just uh, steal it. And there's about 40 puzzles, and they're really good puzzles. And they exist on many systems, on Android and iOS, but also on uh, you know, Windows PCs and whatnot. So you can find these puzzles there. And now let me explain one of them, one of my favorite one maybe. So let's zoom in here. So my favorite one is Loopy. Uh, so how it works is you have to, initially you have something like a grid. Uh, maybe I have a better slide to show that actually. Yeah, I have a better slide. So it's not just called Loopy, it has many names. Uh, Loopy is the, the name Simon Tetham uh, used, but I think that's the original name and that's how it is known for. So you get something like a grid and the grid cells have numbers on them and you have to draw one curve, one line, basically, which uh, connects these cells in some way, such that the number of line segments you have next to each cell is exactly the same as the number, okay? So here you have a two in the second cell from the top over there, and so you have to have two of these four uh, line segments should be part of this curve, okay? Or of this large line. And here you have three, and so on. Some of the cells don't have a number, then, it's a, then you can do whatever you want, okay? Some have zero here, then you have no nothing. So for instance, if you have zero here, you immediately know 
that you don't need any of these edges here. Uh, if you have a three here, for instance, you immediately know that you probably need these two edges because it has to be one curve. If you wouldn't have them, then you can only have two of them, so you need those. So you can, with very little local rules, basically, you can start filling up this board, but then, and that's the reason why I like it so much, then you also need a global rule at some point because you have to make sure that the whole curve is, is one curve, right? It's not several curves or something, okay? So it's a local global thing, and I love these things, okay? That's, that's half of distributed computing theory, I would say. Local or global, right? Uh, that's what we always try. You know, routing is global, MIS is local, or is it local? That's our paper, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, so this loop is very nice. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> it's a definition of distributed computing, local and global. Yeah, so I think loopy is perfect. And with this Simon Tatham puzzles, you can completely uh, parameterize everything, so you can play, you know, this loop beyond huge grids, if you like, okay? And if you can also play them on non-grids, so that's basically it can be played on any planar graph, I guess. Good. Uh, not just with uh, grids. So what we tried is we looked at the best reinforcement learning algorithm. So reinforcement learning is the hope that we have as humanity or, or the machines hope to think slow, okay? Maybe not humanity, maybe the machine stream of uh, reinforcement learning. And so here are some of the classic reinforcement learning algorithms. For instance, uh, so this one here is called mu zero, and that's kind of the open source version of alpha zero from Google. You might have heard the playing chess thing. Uh, here's Dreamer, which is another one which is very uh, popular. But there's also some classic ones here like uh, PQN or PPO or something. And this shows for the puzzles, we gave it all the puzzles, okay, all the 40 puzzles, and said, please solve this. We made a little benchmark out of it first. And this is the average time, how many moves it needed to solve the puzzles, okay? These uh, big players here, like, so it needed about two, 3,000 steps to solve a puzzle. If we do it optimally, then we need that many steps at the bottom there, so it's maybe dozens of steps, something like this. So it's much better already, but the big news is that these are only the puzzles that they could actually, that they could solve. Most of them they cannot solve at all, okay? Only very few they could solve. So these are the numbers from those few that could solve. Actually, out of 40 puzzles, they can solve three puzzles. These are the three puzzles that they can solve. Okay, let's, um, with some parameters, let's look at this one here, untangle, just one example, out of the 40 puzzles it can solve, for PPO and Dreamer. And untangle is the puzzle where you have to untangle a network. So you, you're given, in the case of parameter four, you're given a network of four nodes, and now you have to move the nodes around such that it becomes a planar graph, so that the edges don't cross. That's untangle, okay? And they can solve this because you only have to move this one node down here and it's solved, okay? So basically with one move, humans can solve this. And the machine can also solve it 100%. That's what you can see here, right? So the four version, 100% of the puzzles can be solved already with a weird 34 uh, moves on average for this one. This seems to be more reasonable. But if you go to six nodes, this is super easy for humans, okay? You, you wouldn't, it would take you no time to solve this. Machines need 2,000 steps to solve it. It kind of shows it just does something random, right? It doesn't really understand what's going on. And if I have something like untangle with eight nodes, it's still super easy for humans, actually. Machine cannot solve it anymore. So this shows that all these great reinforcement learning elements don't work at all. And so what is beautiful about it, so many of these puzzles are actually parameterizable, almost all of them. So you can make them more and more complicated. This is also true for something like Sudoku, uh, where you can, of course, play the normal Sudoku, like the one you might have seen, but you can also play smaller versions of it, or actually you can play larger versions of it. This is the 16 by 16 Sudoku. Good. Okay, so we think 
I think, I think I should say that, that these puzzles are a gateway to understand this thinking slow better. If we can, once we can solve these, I think maybe there's, then humanity is doomed finally, okay? So that's the, the way to say it maybe. So, you know, because I, th and I, I think it has something to do with distributed computing, okay? So that's just because I spent my whole life in it. Now I hope that this is true. But basically in distributed computing, we do things like local and global, right? We, when we solve a Sudoku, we look at, let's say, the cells locally and we think, can I solve this? Can I figure out what number goes there? I could explain Sudoku to you, but I think you, many of you should know it, right? You have to find an, a digit here between one and nine, such that you don't have this number already in the row, in the column, or in this subcell here. And this will be very difficult here to find the figure. Many numbers can still go here. But then maybe there's other places, like this one here, which are much easier to fill out, okay? What goes there? Somebody sees it? Four, exactly. It's the only thing that can go there, okay? So as humans, we do that, right? We, we do that, we check locally, what can we solve? And I think, in some sense, graph neural networks that we talked about yesterday, they can also do that somehow. So these nodes here, they can try to figure out what they are locally. They can try to figure out how sure they are about what they want to write there. And once they know something, they're pretty sure, they can tell their neighbors about it, and then they can update their state somehow. So it feels like it's the same distributed learning algorithm that we could use here. And we did try it for Sudoku. There should be a little animation here. So the white cells are already decided, and then the dark blue cells have to be decided. And some of them already have the right guess. And actually, the darker a cell is, the more sure we are about it. And now what we do is we just fill in one cell after the other sequentially, but very greedily actually, until everything is filled in. And you can see at this point, this is completely known. And I go back quickly again. So here's the beginning of the animation. You see some of the cells are still wrong. It's not so sure about them maybe. I think dark blue and light blue are not so easily decidable. But it goes from top uh, left to bottom right. Always the most sure cell. And you see these here, it's not so clear yet. But at some point, uh, when it has done enough here, then actually this starts to change and then they become also very clear and then it actually fills them in right away. So this seems to be doable. And that's something we could not do so far. And same for, this is Kakuro. This is also one of these puzzles. Uh, it's also a fun one. So the rules here are, it's like a crossword puzzle, but, uh, but with numbers. So it's a cross number puzzle. Uh, so it tells you what is the sum of the digits that you have in each row or column here. For instance, this should be 12, and this should be six here with these three, so there must be one, two, and three. They all have to be different, so there's some rules. Okay. And they can do the same thing. And we tried also with tens. So that's also one of the puzzles that we can solve simple ones at least so far. This is part of the Simon Tatham puzzle collection where you have to put up tens next to trees such that no tens are too close to each other and you, the number of tens in the rows and columns are given to these numbers, with these numbers on the side. And we want to solve these learn how to solve this, and once we can solve it, we want to understand it on a larger scale. Good. Yeah, uh, so let's go back. So the hope is to be able to solve thinking slow problems through puzzles. And essentially the hope is, so it may, you may have heard of these Atari games, they were one of the first really exciting things happening uh, in learning, in machine learning. Uh, because when, uh, when DeepMind showed that it can solve these Atari games, uh, it was a considered a huge breakthrough. And my hope is that the puzzle collections are in some sense the same thing on this side. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to do that. But we haven't really solved it yet, okay? So it's just, uh, we're, we're working on this. Good, yeah, uh, algorithms is also great, of course, if you could figure out algorithms. And this is a famous benchmark as well. It's called the CLRS algorithm benchmark. 
in the machine learning community. People like it. Uh, and it, it basically built a benchmark with all the algorithms in this book, okay? Uh, and it uses, and this is the weird thing, or the surprising thing, it, the benchmark goes through graph neural networks, okay? So all the algorithms, not, the, not just the graph algorithms, but also the other algorithms are basically, they are described as graph problems, okay? You kind of think of, you know, sorting numbers, which is, some, of course, part of this book, and you can think of it as a graph, right? How the numbers are connected and whatnot. So, so all of these go through graphs. So in some sense, this, this is the reason why I hope that graphs could play a role here, but, but it could also be, you know, this is one of the other dudes who does this, uh, Peter. Uh, there's only like three or four groups in the world who like this so much right now. We're one of them and he maybe has the leading group in this area. Yeah, so we try to do that. We try to make a better version of the CLRS benchmark, which is a bit more, uh, which can work with bigger data, essentially. Because if you take CLRS and you make the graphs too big or the data sets too big, then it basically have out of memory uh, problems immediately and we try to sparsify it a little bit to, to make it better. Good, but let's not talk about that. In this work, oh. we learn graph algorithms using... Oh no, this is the same problem as yesterday again. I can only, maybe I can make it. <laughs> okay, this way it works. Okay, so we, this is another thing we try to do. Let me start again quickly. So we want to learn graph algorithms. As I said before, that could be something which could be cool. And I think that's something even somebody mentioned to me at dinner yesterday, that it would be good if these graph neural networks had some sort of, uh, recurrent version of it. It's not just a feed forward network where you just have a DAG, but you kind of think again, right? So what we want to do is we want to extrapolate. We want to learn on very small graphs and then we want to run the same thing on much larger graphs. And with a normal GNN, as I explained yesterday, this cannot work so, so much, right? Because normal GNN, you have to, you have a fixed number of layers you do and in every layer, you can get to further and further distances of the original node, but, uh, but then you cannot get, you know, if the graph is bigger, then you don't get to these nodes at all. So the hope would be to use something like a recurrent GNN with the idea that you, in, in algorithms, you always have this, at some point, you have this recurrent step in the middle where you, uh, where you do the same thing again and again. And we can do this to some degree. That's, uh, didn't want to start at the beginning, but maybe. This, I cannot really start it from where, somewhere in the middle, huh? Can I? No. Okay, that was a mistake. Uh, good, but we can do this to some degree, but we can't do it to, uh, you know, to our, we don't like it yet. So for instance, one problem we have is if, uh, if we are in this recurrent step, we, had, we have no good way to learn when to stop this step, when to not do the recurrency anymore. So what we do right now is just we hard code for the input example, how often do we do the recurrent step in the graph neural network? And, uh, and that's something we cannot, we don't know how to do it, for instance. Good. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. Let me tell you about something else I like, uh, which is slightly different. So this is, uh, I just mentioned in the coffee break, the Davos people. So this is from the Davos people. Uh, so they have something called the ARC uh, challenge. And uh, so originally this comes from a machine learning person, famous machine learning person called Francois Cholet. And they also, so Francois Scholle also looks at the question, can you solve harder problems with machine learning than we are used to? Kind of, can we do thinking slow, okay? I'll give you an example here. Maybe most of you have never heard of this ARC challenge. So the ARC challenge is different from usual machine learning. You don't have millions of examples. You just have very few examples to learn something. 
So here you, what you get in the arc challenge, you get two or three examples for input-output pairs. For instance, you get this picture here. It's always pixels, uh, pictures with some pixels. So this is the input, and this is the output, okay? And then you get a second example. This is the input, and this is the output. And then you get a third example, input, and this is the output. So now what you have to do is you have to look at the examples and you have to, for a new example, for the same data set, so to speak, you have to produce the output. I guess you know what the output will be here, right? Yes? I was saying about the distribution of intelligence tests for humans would be the picture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, this is also an intelligence test for humans, very much so. I, uh, yeah, at some point that, these things are available. Most of these tests are available, so you can check yourself uh, how, uh, how good you are at this. So this is still base level. So it's just filling in basically the, the closed uh, faces or the closed surfaces. But what about this? So here we have input output. So this is the input. This is the output. It's, it's horizontal now to just confuse you more. This is the input. This is the output. What is the rule? The shape, yeah, the color, the shape in the correct color, like in the top left corner. But machines, of course, this is very difficult for them, right? You could just get two examples, you have to do that. That's, they, they don't like that. Some machine learning people would say this is not even machine learning anymore, okay? Because it's not fair <laughs> for the machine. Why is it not fair? Because it has a lot of human knowledge inside, right? We think in terms of shapes, in terms of colors, in terms of symmetries, whatnot. And it basically assumes all this already. For instance, it assumes that you understand that you can turn these things by 90 degrees and they're still the same thing, right? Object. So that's something humans are good at. Let me give you another example. What is, so we have input and output. Four examples here even. Input, output, input, output. What is the output for that thing on the right? And why? It sums up something? Yeah. The height? No, why? Like the red here is less than the yellow. But it's red as output. It's only the lower half? But you see, it becomes an intelligence test at some point. This is actually the puzzle. When I went through them and I, I felt like, I, I know this, I know this, I know this, I know this, and then I got to this one, I'm, oh shit, I don't know this. <laughs> I could have solved it because uh, you're always allowed to have three guesses and uh, apparently it's either two, two by two yellow or two by two red. So uh, I tried those two and it was correct. But I think it's, uh, it's subtraction. Okay, you subtract the lower one the lower bar from the upper bar, and then the output is the color which is the higher, or the upper from the lower. The upper from the lower, I think, yeah? So four minus two is two, and this is one. No, oh, no, it doesn't, yeah, this is three, this works. I think it's subtraction, the lower, lower minus upper, and then whatever is more. But you know, it's, it's difficult. So we tried solving this. Uh, we tried solving this without GNNs, just you know, as a funny story. Uh, so what we did is we, we we thought these large language models are really smart, right? We just use them. So what we do is we do an encoder, which takes the picture and then describes the picture with words, okay? And then we give the encoder, like we give the examples, what is the input picture with words, what is the output picture with words, you give it to a large language model. And then we say, what's the solution for this new problem? And then it spits out some words, and then we convert this back to a picture, okay? And then if it gets the right picture, it's solved. And we can solve some things with that. For instance, on the right-hand side, you have the example of some gray bars, and what you should do is you color the biggest bar with blue and the smallest bar with red. And the large language model can do that. So we describe the image 
with words, and then it says what it should do, and then it can do this. It can do a bunch of them, but not many, actually. Very few. So the best solution for this problem, for this whole arc challenge, is a solution where somebody wrote 10,000 lines of Python code to program every, everything they have seen in all the, all the publicly available things and just brute forces then tries to combine these, ten, these things okay, together. Thousands of little ideas combined together, sometimes lucky. So that can solve some of the puzzles, about 40% of them. But if you do it with some other fancier technique, it's really usually very bad. Good. Uh, yeah, let's go back to this one. It won't take me to 12 today, but I don't think it's a problem, right? <laughs> good. Uh, very good. So maybe one more thing or two more things, something like this. Just, you know, it's all hopefully somewhat entertaining pictures. So I want to talk about graph generation. That's also something we tried a little bit. So this is also with graphs, it's a slightly different problem. You want to generate something. It's like uh, generative models, like producing pictures from words, but this is from graphs to graphs. So one thing we tried is you give the program we have a bunch of graphs of some type, and then you say produce one more of that type, okay? And it should not be one which you have already seen as example, it should be a different one, okay? So that's the task. You give me a few examples, you produce one more. So now what we did here is, so these are the true graphs here on the left. So this is basically one of the input graphs. So for instance, this will be a planar graph and we give a bunch of planar graphs. This is something which is kind of like a clustering, which has some edges between the clusters. And this is a protein graph. This is a real biological graph. And you can see here, here are the, is the competition, okay, what, how they did. This is from our paper, so this is to make sure that uh, we do well uh, with these examples. So this is our paper. And what we do here in the paper is we basically do a spectral uh, method. So we take the graphs, we take their mat adjacency matrix or and basically then you have these eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the graphs. And that's kind of like our global help, how the, how the new build graph should look like with the eigenvectors, eigenvalues. And then we have some local rules as well. And you can see this works reasonably well, I would say. So this will, you know, some of the competitors completely fail in these uh, tasks sometimes, but these work reasonably well. I think, but here you can see this does not look the same as over there. Not quite. But it's an interesting problem, I think. And we tried it a few times with different methods. We have tons of students at ETH that can implement all sorts of things. So one the method we tried is uh, generation with algorithms. So we tried to, so you, I give you a bunch of graphs as examples, and then you try to build a piece of code which produce these algorithms again, and if they can produce them perfectly, then we say, ah, now we have the recipe for this graph, and then we can just give you, output a new graph based on the, with these recipes. And it's like pseudo Python code, essentially, where we loop, so these two things are fixed, we loop uh, for all the nodes, and then there's also an inner loop, which is also fixed, and then we do something else here, and then here we have a lot of freedom, what we wanna do. And does it work? Not really. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it's not. For instance, you give it a reference graph, a grid, so we get a bunch of grids. Then it generates something like a grid, but it's not perfect, right, as you can see here. Uh, it works very well for lobster graphs. It looks really pretty well, but for proteins, for instance, uh, it doesn't look well at all. Yeah, so generation is cool. Something else we tried is not exactly graph, but a little bit, so it's a, uh, Origami, uh, again, a student project. There's always one author here, which is actually a student, okay? So that's the beauty of it. Uh, so origami, you know, I guess, you have to fold a piece of paper so that it gets a certain shape. So what we do is we basically give it a shape. So in this example here, we give it a box shape 
And we say now you figure out how to fold this piece of paper to make it a box shape. And it really then tries to, then this is actually a graph, the piece of paper, you have a graph inscribed on it and, and every edge and node, these are where you can make folds. And we try to figure out a way to fold it. And this one works perfectly right. This is really a beautiful box. Uh, perfectly matches what we want, but sometimes it also doesn't work so well. So these are some other examples. So bucket, this is the animation just flattened out. Bucket, it works reasonably well. Chair, it's, you can actually maybe recognize the chair, uh, the lower, uh, the lowest uh, line here. Table, not bad, but shelf, I'm not so sure, okay. Yeah. As a, a visual picture in 3D, okay. yeah, essentially like a, like a point cloud, for instance, would work. I think that's what we used here. Yeah, a 3D picture. It already helps in the things you compare Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Good. Maybe one last example. Explanation. Something I also like. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to explain what's going on, right, in machine learning. You don't, not, not just want to have an output, this is a cat or this is a dog. You want to know why something is a cat or a dog, right? Like what, why did the machine decide that way? Actually, the Europeans are really uh, excited about this idea. The European Union thinks this is the most important thing. You should always be ex able to explain what's going on. So this is a paper we just, this was just accepted last week or something but I like it very much. So, so with explanations, forget about the picture quickly, let me go back. So with explanations, what they do in images, for instance, is that they highlight the pixels which are most important, okay? So let's say you have a, a bird there in the picture, then they would highlight the pixels which made it most think that this is a bird, something like the beak of the bird or the wings, or I don't know what it is, okay? But they would, that's what you can do very well. But for graphs, it's not so clear what you can do to explain something. And so this is one example from, uh, from a data set. This is the so-called proteins data set we have heard before. So proteins are, and I'm not a biologist and I have basically no clue, okay, but, uh, but basically proteins are graphs, so I understand that much. <laughs> and uh, this is a protein, okay, for some reason. And proteins have three types of nodes. One is S, because there's an S here. One is H, I see H is here. And then not, there's another third one, which I forgot. I think it's a T or something. There's a third type of node. Now, with proteins, you can ask questions, like with everything biology, chemistry, you can ask, uh, for instance, is a protein an enzyme, okay? And then it will tell you, yes, it's an enzyme, not, no, it's not an enzyme. Typical glass, uh, graph classification, it just has a ton of proteins. Some of them are enzymes, some of them are not enzymes, and then it tries to find out the rule. But now we want to explain the rule, okay? We want to make it human readable. What is the enzyme? And these three are, is prior work, okay? So what they do is, for every graph you give them, for every protein you give them, they say it's an enzyme or not an enzyme, and then they do something on top of it. So for instance, this one here highlights the nodes, okay? So some nodes are more yellow than others. These are not yellow because they're S's, but this is the model telling us that this is probably important, okay? To make sure that this is an enzyme. Now, does this help you to understand what is the rule, what is an enzyme? I'm not sure, okay? So maybe you might think S's are important, okay? This one here marks edges, so it marks this edge here. Uh, and maybe, again, okay, you can say maybe these two S's is what makes an enzyme. And this one here does subgraphs, and you get the same, it's just a subgraph here, which is important. Again, the two S's. So, so now you might think, if you look at this one example, you might think it's the two S's connected which make a protein an enzyme, okay? That's what would be my guess. Now you can make, look at many other enzyme proteins and non-enzyme proteins together with what is marked. And then you can try to figure out what's going on. But we wanted to have something slightly more complicated. We wanted to have a rule, an explanation which goes for the whole graph set, not just for each individual example, okay? But we wanted to build like a recipe, that's in the title here, for what makes a graph, 
what makes a protein an enzyme or what makes a social network you know, healthy or I don't know, what, whatever your graph question is. And so this is what our solution comes out with. So it's basically decision tree, what is an enzyme, what is not an enzyme in this example. And well, the top one says here, we look at the graph itself and we check how many no sheet nodes we have. And if they're less or equal to eight, then it's an enzyme, okay? So no sheet nodes are the no S nodes in the graph. So you can see in my example over there, it's actually nine nodes which are not S. So it, should, it goes here. And then it looks at the number of sheet nodes and this is less or equal to three, then it's an enzyme. And you can see this is really true here. It's only two S nodes, so it is an enzyme. And so this is, this looks like a silly explanation, but this is exactly what biologists also, this is what the real experts have as a rule, okay? So it's quite, I like it. Uh, the reviewers didn't understand it, but uh, <laughs> they still accepted the paper now, so I'm happy. But, uh, but basically uh, this is, I think this is a really cool uh, application for understanding what's going on. This is also the best example we can come up with. In other cases, it doesn't work so well. Sometimes, of course, you get so complicated decision trees, right? This gets more and more difficult. So we actually put in a slider in our system that you can say, well, this might be a very good explanation for the whole data set or for most of the data set, but you can also slide a little bit back and then you make the decision tree simpler, but the rule, it gets a bit worse. So it have, it's a trade-off between complexity of explanation and accuracy. And you might think, you know, what is, how does it know what is a sheet node or is not a sheet node? So it looks, the input, basically, every node here is a triplet of, of bits. It's a one-hot encoding. So the S, the H, and this third letter, I don't know anymore, T, I think, is, uh, is one bit each. So basically, we have this extra decision tree which tells this decision tree what it should do so that we have this kind of recursive thing going on. So if the input one of the actual input is less or equal to 0 0.5, so it's basically zero, then it's a no sheet node, otherwise it's a sheet node. So this mi middle bit here defines the sheet node. Good, okay. That's it. Now I, I uh, was happy to talk about my favorite thing. So bigger picture. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit, that the puzzle collection could be something cool for learning slow, thinking slow. And generally, I think many problems could maybe be explained as with a graph in thinking slow. So these are essentially, you can, exp you can put them into graph problems and the example of the algorithm collection or uh, algorithm benchmark, which puts everything into a graph, I think is a good example of this. And then the solution of this is some sort of distributed learning where you learn with the nodes individually and maybe then at some point you can merge things together. And this should work well. And I gave you a few examples of maybe, these are not all thinking slow examples, but just what I did in my talk as an overview. Good, I'm done. I, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, see, somebody. Yeah. Because many, many years ago, people were solving these puzzles, like these so called like puzzles that you have, like chess, like a game like chess, right? They program a, a teacher. A yes. Yeah, the hope would be that we don't have to do pre-processing at the end, uh, like speaking for the machine now, right? So the hope would be that you have a picture somehow only, like in the Atari games, and that the pre-processing would also be automatic, to kind of turn this picture into uh, 
graphical representation of what's going on, kind of what we do in our brain probably as well somehow. We have an abstraction level that uh, does that for us. And then solving it there and then putting it back again into actions or so. So the hope is to have a pipeline which goes through all of this somehow. But you know, this is, this is in some sense difficult stuff, right? I don't quite know how this would work and um, I guess the big companies will do it before we can do it, but uh, right now it's a little bit of a dream where to go in five years, right? Uh, and, and, and I think you're right, right? So if you compare it to what we did earlier, there are some connections. Uh, so the hope is just at, at the end of the day, of course, the hope would be that you have a system which no matter what you throw at it, it can do it, right? But that's general artificial intelligence, I guess. And that's, uh, that's still a bit out, I would say. Yeah. Because it's called a subroutine which does it, yeah, right? Because it's very hard to do it quickly. Because yeah. 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 And that's it. But this is the same thing that I think will easily change business between the humans and the machines, right? If, if I hit you now, the human, they're going to say, ouch. And the machine is not say, ouch, unless they have a sensor that is linked with the machine. Yeah. So it says, ouch, when I hit it. So it's, it's really a different at the end for me, yeah? So. Yeah, yeah. And the large language models do have these submachines already, to some degree, like the bigger ones now. They, if you give it a calculation, I'm not sure about ChatGPT GPT-4, but I think it could be that it already does it, that it says basically, ah, this seems like a computation, now let me call the yeah. subroutine that does that. So they're getting there. Yeah, yeah. No, we are not magic in that sense, right? We, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, no good. So the question is to repeat it, it's uh, like they, the big companies have a lot of compute power and we don't, right? So, and they also have a lot of data and we don't, right? So there's, it's always imbalanced and uh, yeah, that's a problem in this area, I would say. I uh, don't have a good solution for it. I think one answer is like you can always do a bit of theory like something that they wouldn't want to do okay so that's maybe one thing to do uh, yeah but generally you have to come up with smart new ways i think what they would value and this is also let's say for the very first example i showed today this this uh, tree like feed forward network maybe they do this already for the large language models we don't know because we can't see in them but I think if we can show that it works for Bart or Bert, it was one of them, I forgot, Bert, then, uh, then it shows to them how, what can be done, right? And then of course they could implement the same thing there, which would be super nice already just from an energy consumption point of view, right? If you can do something like only have 1% of the energy consumption, that would be important. So if you have ideas which, uh, which could be interesting practically, I think you can test it in a much smaller environment. And Still write the paper. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's go, man. Yeah. Thank Thanks. Thanks.